Thank you, Lord, for today. We bless your name. We magnify you, Lord. You are great and greatly to be praised. There is none like you, Lord. Thank you for hearing the cry of our heart for salvation, for healing, Lord, for your will to be done in our lives, for us to hear your voice. God, for us to be still and know that you are God, for us to be sensitive to what you have for each of us, Lord. We're not just living in this world of craziness, but we have you. We know you. There may be demonic spirits all about doing their deeds, doing their evil, what Satan would do in this world, but you were here before him. And you will be here after. There is none like you. And we know you, God. You're our God. And you are our Savior, our Shepherd, our hope, our life. We know you, God. We know you in the deepest of our heart. And we trust you. We won't go flailing about, but we will look to you, Lord, for your help in our life. And there will be no weapon formed against us that will prosper. For you are the God that we rely on. You are the one that we know. You are the one we trust. There is no failure in you. You didn't fail us if we don't see an answer. God, you've, you've never failed us. You have a perfect plan. Thank you for your word, God. Open our hearts to receive. Open our minds to accept your direction today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm climbing a mountain. My faith could not move. It's the only way forward. It's the only way through. There's no bridges or highways, directions or plans. These pathways of presence remind me again. I've got a father who knows me by name. And I've got a shepherd who won't lead me astray. I've got a future. I've got a hope. I've got a promise. I'm never alone. Life is a journey through the highs and the lows. There's no need to hurry, let's just take it slow. The time we've been given is the treasure we hold. And the older I'm getting, this one thing I know. I've got a father who knows me by name. And I've got a shepherd who won't lead me astray. I've got a future. I've got a hope. I've got a promise. This is my promise. I'm never alone. Lord, I'm never alone. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we appreciate you today. And we know that we are never alone with you. You are our hope. You are our help. You are our strength. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah had escaped to the mountain of God. Mount Sinai, which was also where Moses had gone. And Elijah goes there and he's trying to search for God. He's calling out, I've done everything I need to do, but they're killing all of the prophets. 
they've come up against me and they are killing all of the prophets. And he's so distressed. He's walked miles to get to the mountain of God. And there was an earthquake. There was thunder. And there was fire. But God was not in it. Until he heard a gentle whisper. After the fire came a gentle whisper. On the morning of August 27th of 1883, ranchers in Alice Springs, Australia, heard what sounded like gunshots. The same mysterious sound was reported in 50 geographical locations spanning one thirteenth of the globe. What those Aussies heard was the eruption of a volcano on the remote Indonesian island of Krakatoa, 2,233 miles away. That volcano eruption, possibly the loudest sound ever measured, was so loud it was 310 decimal, decibel sound waves. It circum, circumnavigated the globe at least four times. It generated 3,000 foot tidal waves and threw rocks a distance of 40 excuse me, 34 miles and cracked one foot thick concrete 300 miles away. Can you imagine? <laughs> if, if you were to drill a hole directly through the center of the earth opposite of Krakatoa, you would find Columbia, South America. Although the sound of the eruption wasn't audible in Columbia, there was a measurable sound in the atmospheric pressure because of the infrasonic sound waves that caused the air to tense. The sound may not have been heard, but it was felt all the way around the world. According to science journalists and New York Times col columnist Maggie Corth Baker, just because you can't hear a sound, it doesn't mean it isn't there. A low level sound is imperceptible. At high levels, it's unignorable. If sound exceeds 110 decibels, we experience a change in blood pressure. At 141 decibels, we become nauseous. At 145 decibels, our vision blurs because our eyeballs vibrate. At 195 decibels, our eardrums are in range of rupturing and death by sound waves can happen at 202 decibels. The act of hearing is detecting vibrations of the eardrum caused by sound waves. And the intensity of those waves is measured in decibels. On one end of the sound spectrum is the sperm whale, the loudest animal on earth. The clicking noise it uses to echolocate can hit 200 decibels. Even more impressive, researchers believe that whale songs may travel up to 10,000 miles underwater. Next to the sperm whale is jet engines, 150 decibels, air horns, 129 decibels, thunderclaps, 120 decibels, and jackhammers, 100 decibels. What's on the other end of the sound spectrum? A whisper. A whisper. It only measures. 15 decibels. Technically speaking, our absolute threshold of hearing is zero decibels. That responds to a sound wave that measures 0 0.000002 pascals, which causes the eardrum to vibrate by just 10 eighths milliliters. That's less than a billionth of the ambient pressure in the air around us and smaller than the diameter of a hydrogen atom. Juxtapose that with this, then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. The ESV version calls it a low whisper. The NASB calls it a gentle blowing. And the King James version calls it a still, small voice. 
we tend to dismiss as insignificant the natural phenomenon that preceded the whisper because job because God was not in them. But I bet that Elijah's attention, God has an outside voice and he's not afraid to use it. But when God wants to be heard, when what he has to say is too important to miss, he often speaks in a whisper just above the absolute threshold of hearing. The question, of course, is why and how, when and where. Those are the questions that we can explore in the sound of silence. The Hebrew word for whisper, domina, can be translated silence or stillness or calmness. Simon and Garfunkel weren't far off with the title of their 1964 song, The Sound of Silence. The same Hebrew word is used to describe the way God delivers us from our distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. And that psalm foreshadows the way Jesus would stop a storm in its tracks with three words. Quiet, be still or peace, be still. His whisper is gentle, but nothing is more powerful. When he said, peace, be, feel, be still, the waves, the storm, silent. That was the power of his whisper, of his request. His whisper, gentle, powerful, cannot be mistaken. My Dictionary defines whisper as speaking very softly using one's breath without one's vocal cords. The use of breath instead of vocal cords is significant. Isn't that how God created Adam? He whispered into the dust and named it Adam. Adam was once just a whisper, and so were you. So was everyone else. Whispering is typically employed for the sake of secrecy. No form of communication is more intimate, and it seems to be God's preferred method. The question again is why, and I won't keep us guessing any longer. When someone speaks in a whisper, you have to get very close to hear. In fact, you have to put your ear near the person's mouth. We lean toward a whisper, and that's what God wants. The goal of hearing the Heavenly Father's voice isn't just hearing his voice, it's intimacy with him. That's why he speaks in a whisper. He wants to be as close to us as is divinely possible. He loves us, likes us that much. When our children were young, I would occasionally play a trick on them and speak in a whisper so they would inch closer to me. That's when I would want to give them a big old hug because they would have to get real close to hear what was being said. God does that. He wants to hear. Uh, we want to hear what he has to say, but he wants to know how much we love him and he loves us. The voice of the spirit is as gentle as a Zephyr and Oswald Chambers. So gentle that unless you are living in perfect communion with God, you never even hear it. Aren't you grateful for a gentle God? The Almighty could intimidate us with his outside voice, but he woos us with a whisper. And his whisper is the very breath of life. Oswald Chambers continued saying that the cheeks, the checks, excuse me, of the spirit come in the most extraordinary gentle ways. And if you are not sensitive enough to detect his voice, you will quench it and your personal spiritual life will be impaired. His checks always come as still, small voice, sm so small that no one but the saint notices them. For the past decades, there have been times that I would be so busy in my mind thinking about things that were going on or contemplating ideas and all of this, that I've silenced that voice and that beautiful whisper of the Lord. We can listen to what we have all around us every day, or we can choose to separate ourselves and hear that whisper. 
that time when God is opening his heart to us, when he is knocking on our door and saying, let me tell you who you are to me. We can discern that good and pleasing voice of the Lord, what he has to hear out, what he has to say to us for us to hear. That's how we see and seize divine appointments. That's how God-sized dreams are birthed. That's how miracles happen. There are days and then there are days that alter every day thereafter. In life, we have situations that change everything about our life. But when we stop and we let God be the center of those things in our life, it will transform the decisions that we make to become part of what he has desired for us. It is so important for us to know that God is very close and very able to speak to us when we take the time to listen to what he has to say. Again, David was very keen on listening to what God had to say. And he was told what to do in every circumstance. And he stopped to hear. It always amazes me when we're reading in saw in Samuel, first Samuel, and it talks about the Lord said to do this or to do that. When we read that, oftentimes in our lives, we separate ourselves from the reality of that. We can't understand that type of communication with God. None of us can. But it is viable. It is available. It is able to happen for our lives. He gave us his spirit to fill us and to guide us and to give us peace when we're making decisions, when we're trying to go forward in life and know what to do and how to do it how to take care of this problem or, or that situation. And in Samuel 24, after Saul returned from fighting the Philistines, he was told that David had gone into the wilderness of En Gedi. So Saul chose 3,000 elite troops from all Israel and went to search for David and his men near the rocks of the wild goats. Again, he was told where David was. He was consumed by other people's directive. It wasn't the Lord telling him. He was just going about like a madman. At the place where the road passes some sheepfolds, Saul went into a cave to relieve himself. But as it happened, David and his men were hiding further back in that very cave. Now's your opportunity, David's men whispered to him. Today, the Lord is telling you, I will certainly put your enemy into your power to do with as you wish. So David crept forward and cut off a piece of the hem of Saul's robe. Even David's men had it in their head that David would go and slaughter Saul where he was standing in his vulnerable position. And they even said, today the Lord is telling you. David knew the Lord's voice. He was very, very clear on the Lord's voice. So he cut off that piece of robe, but then David's conscience began bothering him because he had cut Saul's robe. So even that act, him kind of being tempted by his men, he knew that God didn't tell him to do that. So he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do this to my Lord, the King. I shouldn't attack the Lord's anointed one for the Lord himself has chosen him. So David restrained his men and did not let them kill Saul. After Saul had left the cave and gone on his way, David came out and shouted after him, My Lord, the king. And when Saul looked around, David bowed low before him. Then he shouted to Saul, Why do you listen to the people who say I'm trying to harm you? This very day you can see with your own eyes that it's not true. For the Lord placed you at my mercy back there in the cave. 
Some of my men told me to kill you, but I spared you. For I said, I will never harm the king. He is the Lord's anointed one. Look at, look, my father, at what I have in my hand. It's a piece of the hem of your robe. I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. This proves that I am not trying to harm you and that I have not sinned against you, even though you have been hunting for me to kill me. May the Lord judge between us. Perhaps the Lord will punish you and for what you are trying to do to me, but I will never harm you. As that old proverb says, from evil people comes evil deeds. So you can be sure I will never harm you. Who is the king of Israel trying to catch anyway? Should he spend his time chasing one who is worthless as a dead dog or a single flea? May the Lord therefore judge which of us is right and punish the guilty one. He is my advocate and he will rescue me from your power. When David had finished speaking, Saul called back, Is that really you, my son David? Then he began to cry. He said to David, You are a better man than I am, for you have repaid me good for evil. Yes, you have been amazingly kind to me today, for when the Lord put me in a place where you could have killed me, you didn't do it. Who else would let this his enemy get away when he had put him in his power? May the Lord reward you well for the kindness you have shown me today. And now I realize that you are surely going to be king and that the kingdom of Israel will flourish under your rule. Now swear to me by the Lord that when that happens, you will not kill my family and destroy my line of descendants. So David promised this to Saul with an oath. Saul went home, but David and his men went back to their stronghold. And God has helped David through his attitude toward the king. God has made him strong. So in his waiting, he gained strength. And these are some of the Psalms that he wrote. O Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rage. Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. I am sick at heart. How long, O Lord, until you restore me? Return, O Lord, and rescue me. Save me because of your unfailing love. For the dead do not remember you. Who can praise you from the grave? I am worn out from sobbing all night. I fled my bed with weeping, drenching it with tears. My vision is blurred by grief. My eyes are worn out because of all my enemies. Go away, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord will answer my prayer. May all my enemies be disgraced and terrified. May they suddenly turn back in shame. David was clear on who and where his help comes from. He was very clear on that. And I just encourage each of us to have that solid foundation of who God is. And I pray today for the salvation for every nation. In Jesus' name, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and being filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in tongues, that the Spirit of God would speak through us with His voice, because we don't know what we need to pray for ourselves, but He does. And He will speak through us with utterances, that we don't even understand, but it will heal our hearts, our minds, and give us direction in our lives. And I just thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for your hope. I thank you for this day. And we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen.